project. This webinar series is an initial activity of the network, which will be the way forward of the ATMI ASEAN project beyond its life cycle. Therefore, uh, there will be more coming up uh, in the next webinar series. Therefore, if you are interested to find uh, more information about the network and the activities of the project, please type your email in the chat box. We will um, send the information to your email address. My name is Anik Fadila. I'm policy facilitator of the ATMI project. I will not moderating the webinar today. We will have we have uh, Sir Paul uh, Joseph uh, Ramirez, uh, the project support unit uh, coordinator from Sierka. Sierka is our um, uh, co implementer of the ATMI project. So please, uh, Sir Paul, to moderating the session. Over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Anik, uh, and uh, good, good day to, to everyone. Welcome to uh, the fourth uh, installment of our NEP uh, webinar series. Uh, as mentioned by uh, Anik earlier, um, as for those who are first time participants in the series, the NEPA is actually the uh, network of policy advi advisors and analysts in the ASEAN region. And it's an initiative to sustain the dissemination of what we've done through the ATMI ASEAN project. And that includes research, capacity strengthening, and knowledge man management activities. We hope that uh, through this network, we will be able to uh, continue the culture of sharing knowledge and information, relevant and useful to facilitate uh, food security and inclusiveness through agricultural transformation and mar market integration in the ASEAN region. So in this particular session, I have the honor to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Devesh Roy, who will talk about their work entitled Assessing the Effects and Coping Mechanisms of Trade Sanctions on Myanmar, I look through a different um, margin of adjustment. Uh, Dr. Devesh uh, Roy is a senior uh, research fellow at IFRI and with ex uh, areas of expertise in the, uh, international trade, environment, term farm linkages, uh, food safety, and has been involved in uh, notable researches related to economics of animal disease outbreaks, food safety in developing countries, food security in South Asian countries, among many others. So for today's session, he will be sharing with us the result of their assessment on the impacts and coping strategies related to the nearly one and a half decade trade, uh, trade sanctions imposed on Myanmar. Uh, to better facilitate our virtual discussion later, we encourage everyone to feel free to type in the Q&A box, your questions and comments, and we will allow Dr. Devesh to respond during the open forum at the end of the session. So without further ado, let us all welcome Dr. Devesh. Devesh, you have 25 minutes for the presentation. So, thank you, sir. This is uh, uh, really a pleasure because this is, I know we uh, started by saying this is uh, part of the ATMI ASEAN. ATMI uh, actually stands for Agriculture Transformation and Market Integration in ASEAN countries. Uh, now, so one of the um, leading principles, so to say, in uh, in the ATMI ASEAN project, when you look at market integration, uh, the strength of market integration is always on, apart from that, it leads to increase in incomes or increase in welfare. I mean, if successful, but the big part of any market integration arrangement, any trading arrangements, any other market integration arrangement is how do they deal with shocks and how do they work in coping with shocks? So these are the uh, two things on which you know, we always uh, wanted to focus in an ATMI ASEAN. We had done a lot of work related to say COVID shock that you know how market integration arrangements, uh, uh, the trading arrangements that have worked within the ATMI ASEAN countries. But this is something which we really wanted to uh, re take into account that you know whatever is the arrangement, the partnership within ASEAN and uh, uh, how do they deal with shocks? And shocks can be of different types. We know that there are financial shocks, there was a food price crisis, there was definitely now the COVID shock that we have re recently. But one of the you know uh, little exceptional shock that within the set of countries that this project focuses on is uh, is the shock in Myanmar on it being subject to sanctions. Now it has been recently uh, because of some developments that they have been, the shocks 
uh, in some way have been reinstated uh, in terms of uh, sanctions, but this is the phase one of sanctions that you know uh, Myanmar had from 2003 onwards, and that's what we are going to uh, focus on. I want to see what were the trade-related effects and what were the coping mechanisms. How did the adjustment take place, and what role did ASEAN countries as like? because it's, a, it's an ASEAN con, uh, member country that how, what role did they play in, in this adjustment? So, yeah. So just briefly, this is not uh, totally the pr presentation is on the economics of uh, sanctions as such, but just to give a, um, so there's a, a quite a bit of literature on, uh, you know, Sanctions, I mean, sanctions can be of different types. Now, there are issues and why in the literature, if you see why are they imposed, what kind of a sanction, are they bilateral sanctions, are they multilateral sanctions? Uh, so, I'm we're really looking at the sanctions that were uh, imposed in Myanmar in 2003. Uh, so, they could be comprehensive, they could be selective. Uh, that, you know, selective is that, you know, you have specific trade activities that they did with Libya. There's a comprehensive, uh, which is like asset freeze, broad restrictions on trade. Uh, in that way, there were a lot of asset freeze, financial kind of uh, sanction that were put on Myanmar, uh, but there were also some lot of uh, trade restrictions. This is firstly focusing on the trade side of work. Uh, so if you, so the, why is what's the motivation for us for looking at so uh, Myanmar definitely among uh, ASEAN countries it's a small country from a trade perspective it's uh, more importantly from a technical side in trade it's uh, its exports and imports are kind of less diversified and whenever you have less diversification across partners across products be on the export side or import side then um, shocks in to have a disproportionate Im impact. So the idea is that we are going to say that with that uh, landscape, there's US, US sanctions or these uh, sanctions which are also imposed by the European Union, uh, that could have uh, significant effects on uh, Myanmar. Now the idea that you said that there's some literature, but um, overall uh, literature is on sanctions is quite thin in economics. That's number one. And when you come in particular to Myanmar is uh, um, more or less non-existent, but there are a couple of uh, paper that have tried to look at it. And this is another one that we are trying to contribute within the ACNI ASEAN project. So we also uh, augment the literature in uh, by bringing in some pioneering work of uh, Kiho and Rule, uh, they actually, they became like the pioneering work in trying to, in a very simple way, trying to understand the margins in trade. Now trade, whenever it takes place, it expands or it contracts uh, uh, on what trade economists call two margins. One is an extensive margin, another is the intensive margin. If you have an existing trade relationship in a relationship in the same in a given product, uh, and you either deepen that one or you really reduce the existing uh, trade relationship, then that is like the adjustment intensive margin. But if kind of uh, you get into new products, new markets, new varieties, new prices. Uh, then that's your extensive margin. You get into a new set of product. The QN rule actually showed that their paper focused on what they call as a new goods margin, that how trade expanded in different countries across the world, now, not through what will be an intensive margin, existing uh, export of the products that were there already there in the same trading relationship, but a new set of product. If you, even if you know, and that will be true for ASEAN partnership as well, all the big partnerships. And now when ASEAN is signed into RCEP, uh, there is an ASEAN FTA, all is the trade expansion that will happen. Uh, 
uh, would happen mostly. That's the evidence on in history. Uh, the great big expansion in trade, be it the, the rise of Korea, rise of China, uh, they have happened on extensive margin. That is new products, new varieties, new market. And uh, so that's what QN rule actually showed for only the new goods margin. They're not looking for a new uh, partner margin. There are other papers have looked at the new partner margin, uh, like uh, Hamels and Klino. And I mean, the, these are just, you know, famous papers in trade, which have looked at on the extensive margin. Uh, but papers have not looked at what happens, you know, and they have attributed that if you have uh, uh, trade liberalization, you have structural transformation of the economies, then uh, in, in either of the business cycle, because business cycle means the products get obsolete or new products come in, uh, uh, they are not the main reason for expansion of the extensive margin. It's basically in terms of trade liberalization, in terms of structural transformation, that uh, that's what this paper actually showed uh, in a very significant way. And that's like uh, one of the leading papers that, you know, on uh, extensive margin that uh, came. I mean, you can see it might have thousands of citations, you know. Uh, but what has not been done and what we try to do within the Atmi ASEAN project is to use the Kyo and rule framework uh, and looked at uh, in case of sanctions, that once you put a sanction, what happens to trade and whether it expands contracts on which margins. And we are looking at both the new goods margin as well as the new partner margin. So these are the timeline of sanctions, which have been, is not the main focus, but it's there in, the, in our paper. Uh, that you know what were the elements of the sanction that were there on, on Myanmar, which all financial and you know and different other timelines. Uh, but this this picture is very telling to you that if it should be very telling actually, if you look at this overall export from uh, Myanmar to ASEAN to rest of the world to United States, if you see in the left panel after 2003 it just drops to zero in the US. Uh, and you see a big sharp uh, fall in exports to uh, European Union as well. And then there is ASEAN, with ASEAN 3, which is include China, Japan, and Korea. And what you see there is uh, that continues to increase after the US sanctions and the EU sanctions are imposed in 2003, which can just give you a favor that there would be adjustments taking place on that margin, on the partner's margin, where ASEAN, which is ATMI ASEAN, where we are looking at the role of ASEAN countries, it probably played a pivotal role in terms of uh, acting as a kind of a shock absorber. And then uh, 2016, the sanctions were uh, taken away from the US under Obama administration. And then you see a, a reversal in some dimension on the product margin, some products rebound and some don't And but there is a, would be also an expansion on the. So this is uh, overall after sanctions on the product margin as well as on the partner's margin. So this is what uh, this uh, uh, paper does. I mean, as we say that in ATMI ASEAN market integration part, we have tried to emphasize that how good is the market integration within ASEAN countries is good in terms of increase in trade, but the, one of the kind of a litmus test for uh, the strength of uh, uh, market integration arrangement is how good are they in dealing with shocks. And this is one shock that we are looking in the case of Myanmar. Now, so what we want to show is that, you know, when this uh, trade sanctions were imposed, uh, this, uh, as I said, that, you know, going from Kyo and rule, and then we just try to expand and bring it to sanctions and what adjustment take place when you get a shock in form of sanctions and Myanmar became, becomes the case study. Uh, so we will see that there's a lot of adjustment on the extensive margin. Uh, now, but, so, but what we also want to emphasize that in, in the extensive margin, what is on the product or the goods margin, what kind of goods, what kind of products did 
this extensive margin uh, expanded on. And uh, that's what something, you know, we'll see in case of Myanmar, it was basically on the natural resource base, like uh, gas exports, uh, petroleum product exports. And that really leads to the possibility of what in literature has been known as the Dutch disease, which was named after the experience of the Netherlands uh, uh, when the discovery of the North Sea oil. So the classic example is, was that you know your exchange rate then appreciates, and that makes other exports really more difficult, uh, and that is the classic uh, Dutch disease. And so, but there is much more than just the appreciation of the exchange rate when this happens when the natural resource exports expand. It's also the thing that you know how the resources allocated, whether the government actually uh, goes into. Uh, development or expansion of exports of manufacturing and other products, services, uh, rather than just focus on natural resources, it's sort of a crowding out effect as well. Uh, so the, in Myanmar, the risk is that some industries depend upon the country's possibility of a low cost production, which could be like textiles, could be uh, small manufacturing and so on. That may not happen because the resources, the policy attention might not be uh, recorded to them. Uh, so, and there are remnants within ASEAN from Indonesia, Malaysia, which were formerly oil producing economies in the 70s and 80s. And now their economies to a large extent are driven by manufacturing. So they have kind of, initially you would see that they were also subject to Dutch disease phenomenon. And there's a, a, quite a bit of literature within ASEAN countries which actually shows these things. Uh, I'm not going to get into that a simple way of looking at the impact of sanctions. And uh, because one cannot do it with the proper methodology is that if you look at the empirical models of trade, the workhorse model is definitely the gravity model. And there you can just put a dumb, dummy for the period of sanctions and see whether uh, there is a reduction in trade. You will find that that does not, uh, so this will seem that oh, sanctions did not have any effect, but uh, what we will see that sanctions did have a lot of, uh, uh, adjustments on the extensive margin, because what we said uh, in this one, we cannot capture it because the way it is structured, uh, we are not able to take into account the extensive margin. That is new products, that is the new goods margin, new partners margin uh, that we, uh, and, and this is something which, you know, uh, what happened to the export destinations that also we you know some bit of uh, Literature, I think, in Kuder's paper that actually showed this, Kuber's paper in 2014, that how uh, you know part of trading partner margin actually changed after sanction. So, as you say that you know we we saw this. This is um, now what the Kyo and Ru paper does. That what we are drawing from that they propose a methodology for studying changes in bilateral commodity trade to to goods that were not exported previously or exported in very small amount. That's where it is the extensive margin. On the, and as I said, the QN rule was also focusing on the goods margin. It's a 2013 paper. They call it the least traded goods. And they see over time, how does this list, least traded goods segment expands in trading relationships. And these are what the quantitatively defined is that they have, uh, less than 10%, 20% uh, uh, that they, they do look at different uh, <coughs> segments and how much of is like a least traded good, it could be less than 1% and so on. And, and then they look at the effect of uh, episodes of trade liberalization, structural transformation, and see when the trade expands, is it the new goods that are driving the trade? That their paper, which is the extensive margin, the new goods margin is the name of the, in the paper title itself, that cure and ruler. So they find that the extensive margin is a significant factor in explaining the growth in total trade, surrounding trade liberalization. And, uh, and more importantly, in the countries which had liberalization, which had structural transformation, this is like accounted for over 30% increase in trade uh, and those we did there were no 
liberalization or there was structural transformation less than 2%. So that's also if then that is not only just the changes in the product cycle that new products are coming in or and remember that they are only focusing on the goods margin. So this is but as I said that nothing is on their sanctions. Now if, uh, and this is what you know in some way this research contributes that what happens to intensive versus extensive margins. And then we take the case study of Myanmar uh, in looking at, and, and then we also look at the compositional change and the extensive margin to think about what could be the possible negative effects and what uh, uh, might not be always, because the way it is in Q and rule, it's always taken as a healthier outcome that you're going on the extensive margin. It's the, like Korea example, it's now, 60, 70% is all total extensive margin. We know what happened in Korea. We have LG, we have Hyundai, uh, we have Samsung, and these are all new manufacturers, new products. That's where the expense uh, margins have expanded. So, uh, so this is, uh, if you look at now what uh, I've just, uh, just tried to show some figure uh, that, you know, as we said that, you know, there's nothing that, uh, this literature has looked at, but there's all the reasons to believe that, you know, if you have some sanctions, uh, it's not basically this, if you, uh, you know, what in Kyo and rule would be like the turbulence in business cycle fluctuations are not the factors behind uh, the changes in the uh, trade margins on the extensive side. Uh, it's more about uh, structural transformation, trade liberalization and so on, but as I said, nothing on sanctions. But you can appeal to the turbulence of kind of a business cycle fluctuations, uh, something like that when it comes to sanctions. And then you can see that if you look at now episodes of sanctions, could you relate to something like business cycle fluctuations, like Nelson Plosser kind of thing that the people, if they do macroeconomics, would relate to? So if you look at, as we said, Myanmar is a very potent case study, it does not have that much diversification. So if you look at agriculture sales in my share in Myanmar's export, Myanmar's import, it's overwhelming, right? You don't have a lot of diversification on the non-agriculture side. And this is uh, throughout actually that, you know, uh, you, you find that and that gives you one basis to say what, and product-wide categories of export, if you go to disaggregated category also, go to two digit levels, look at fuels, and agriculture products. And then you find that there is not much diversification within the product category. That is when you go to the variety category and so on. And uh, so this is something that, you know, is when we'll see that, you know, what happens in sanctions that are across these dimensions where uh, on the goods margin, uh, what is the expansion? So now if you look at the export, well, the red line is basically your 2003, which is the sanctions period. And that's the US uh, embargo. That is a sanction that is being put in. And you see that, you know, if you look at uh, go by product category, then you do not see a, in some categories of product, you do not see a nose dive or total, like, you know, we showed the picture where it has steeply dropped to zero. Uh, that did not happen in Myanmar in different products. We look at vegetable and fruit products. And I know the earlier uh, webinar on uh, in Nepal was on uh, Myanmar's export of pulses. And that's included in vegetable and fruit products. So that actually uh, kind of continued. That's a big, uh, almost uh, half of the agriculture exports, 40% uh, of that comes in terms of pulses. So those continued. The other thing that is also important, not only in agriculture, now if you look on the right hand panel, there are two things that, that's plotted. It's basically textile and clothing exports uh, and fuels, which is the petrochemical uh, products. And you see that that has not only continued unabated, it has also increased very steeply. That's your adjustment on the extensive margin. And that's what we'll try to see. Uh, that uh, minerals, metals, uh, then textiles and clothing. Now, textiles and clothing is not uh, so much adjustment on the product margin, but it's also more on the trading partner margin. 
and this is uh, if you look at minerals and uh, fuel then this is more on the product the goods margin as uh, in q and ru so this is something you can see that you know you might look that sanctions are totally ineffective the exports uh, uh, of myanmar has continued and there's one uh, point of caution that is there in myanmar actually does not this is really pr produces uh, export data or uh, gives to uh, unctad the uh, united nation conference on trade and development which is uh, pr produces this data so we are also have to work on the mirror data by going to the importing country data and look at what is being imported from myanmar in order to do a lot of things uh, so if you look at top export destination if you go to the products uh, to the partner margin uh and across all products to different degrees and you'll see that begin to see what is the uh till 2003 if you look at just textiles and clothing the biggest destination was us uh, accounting for 41% then was uk germany the eu countries and uh, most of them they are the ones which were the um, main importer of textile and clothing from myanmar even if you look at uh, but if you go on the agriculture product side and animal products there was lot within asean and asean plus 3 uh, which is china japan uh, and asean country thailand and the us was also important in some animal products that were there so you see this this is up to at the point of sanction now if you prior to sanction this was you look now go on the goods margin uh it was mostly textile that been 76% three quarters of the exports of myanmar were in textiles and then they were uh, and this we just went way back in 1996 right so uh, now if you look at the uh, product wise share for the us market in particular at the point of sanction about 86% an overwhelming share was textiles in the us market for uh, myanmar you look at european union still 77% of uh, at the point of uh, sanctions myanmar share was uh, in myanmar's export share in textile to the european union was 77% so when these two markets and when they it was at least the textiles and clothing segment putting maybe subject to sanctions from these two big markets uh would definitely have a kind of a big ripple effect right and uh, so if is uh, so this is something that you know i'm just going through this is in the paper now you come to 2006 and 2006 is post sanction and now you look at the export composition of myanmar uh what has happened is now you begin to see a different gradation now uh, fuel becomes uh, the petrochemical products become the leading export for myanmar uh this is this gets even more uh, stark it gets starker as we go further down and textile just falls to your third place and that's your if you go to 2013 still that you know the the difference gets starker as i said uh you know in terms of the gradation that you have uh, across different products uh now <clears throat> if you come the la latest data that we've used you know if you come nearer to 2000 the current period which is 2018 then textile then picks up and then gets into a little bit of a parity with fuels or uh, petrochemicals and this is after the sanctions were revoked in 2016 by obama administration so you begin to see that you know so there is a lot of adjustment that is going on in relation to the uh shocks that uh, they come from sanction because you we see that there is a lot of thing adjustment on the goods margin there is a lot of adjustment on the partners margin 
uh, that happen in Myanmar. And, and the second thing is that it happens at a very comparatively high frequency as well. That 2016, you, you have got the sanctions revoked. And in 2018, you can, 17, 18, I mean, just put in the 2018 data, you'll begin to see a lot of uh, a different uh, share of uh, exports that are there in, in case of Myanmar of the different commodity on the products margin, the goods margin, which is essentially the margins for Kyo and Ru. So this is the basic uh, equation that, you know, if you want to formally, we want, we want to show in the paper, uh, is that if you look at the change in the least traded goods as defined in the Kyo and Ru, uh, and then you look at change in overall trade. So, what is the correlation of the association between the change in least traded goods and the trade of least traded goods and the change in overall trade? Uh, so how much of the variation in that is being accounted by the least traded goods? That will tell you the contribution of the extensive margin only in terms of the goods margin that is there in Q and Rule. So this is the equation that one estimates uh, 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 in uh, terms of uh, trying to formally show the extensive margin based on the Q and rule, rule methodology. And uh, then you can look at different time period where they looked at the time periods of structural transformation. They have to look at time periods of trade liberalization in different countries. They are focused on countries like China, Chile, uh, then the segment of NAFTA, which was among North American countries. But one could look at in case of ASEAN countries as well with the same methodology, and you will find the expansion of trade that is happening within ASEAN countries. A big 40, 30, 40% of that is coming from the extensive margin. In this paper, what you know when we estimate this, uh, we are really taking into the world of shocks. That you know, how do the margins of uh, adjustment work uh, when a country like Myanmar uh, being subjected to shocks, which was in uh, particularly the case of sanctions? So this is what, uh, and if you begin to uh, see that this we that we have talked about all this, I'm. Mm, trying to go if you want to go for the goods margin, that is uh, that, uh, and then if you use the Kyo and rule specification. So there are also further element that, you know, and one can look at that, how do this uh, goods margin work over the short run versus the long run? Uh, and uh, in, the Kyo and rules proposition, and that's what also we want to also test in relation to sanction, that how does the extensive margin for Myanmar's export uh, play out over a shorter time window versus a longer time window? And, uh, and what you begin to see, which is this one, this part is actually on the line of what Q and rule have that, you know, the extensive margins are more important over the longer horizon. Uh, so even after, uh, you know, and they're looking in relation to trade liberalization and structural transformation. But if you look at even in case of sanctions, and then you're doing the expansion in response, as we said that, you know, fuels could be textile and clothing to different markets. That's where the adjustments are, that's the margins of adjustment. Uh, these margins of adjustment become more pronounced become more significant over a longer period of time. That's what your uh, regression econometric results will show. And that's what we tested for in case of uh, sanctions that were imposed on Myanmar. And if you go back to the figures that, you know, this extent, uh, extensive margin adjustment, that, that could also be flip-flop that we say that textiles, Till the new trading relationships cropped up and there were new textile exports to Korea, to Japan. Uh, and these, uh, which earlier they were not so important, uh, they were mostly concentrated in the US market and the European Union market. So your extensive market margin adjustments could also be there on, on the side of uh, 
you know, I mean, not on the side, it could also be that you get these reversals over time when you have these extensive margin adjustments. But there is a lot of movement on the extensive margin if you look at a shock like uh, economic sanctions. And this actually gets more pronounced over the longer period of time, which is what, uh, you know, based on first principle that you would expect, right? So I just, you know, I'll conclude because this is, uh, so what, uh, what is the main thesis or main takeaway from this paper? Uh, first of all, it actually tries to contribute by looking at, it's not only the trade expanding kind of changes that one looks at trade liberalization uh, or even uh, looks at structural transformation as is in QO and rule uh, to say that, you know, what happens on the extensive margin vis-a-vis -vis intensive margins of uh, trade uh, changes. Uh, it could be also of things which really inhibit trade, which actually prohibit trade. And that could be, we take a case study of sanctions, knowing that, you know, we, the market integration component uh, in Atmi ASEAN is actually uh, very cognizant of the fact that when you want to look at the health of the trading arrangements, you have to be looking at uh, what happens during shocks. Uh, I mean, then only these are sustainable trading arrangements. If not, then these trading arrangements, you know, a lot of the free trade areas, they just uh, unravel when they are subject to shocks. Uh, and then also the partnership, you are an ASEAN member, and how do your trading partners really fill in uh, if uh, as a shock absorber? And that's what we wanted to see in case of Myanmar. So the least traded goods definitely became very important for Myanmar. Uh, but then the question is that, is it a desirable extensive margin? If you read Kyo and Rule, uh, it's actually with a very positive note that if they take example of Korea, you know, it went to like really sophisticated manufacturing and that is the source of expansion. And uh, so this really also fundamentally changed the, the landscape of the economy in, in these countries. But here what is happening is an expansion is happening through, uh, in the extensive margin through expansion in fuels, petrochemicals and all. So is that a desirable extensive margin? And then we go into the world of the potential of a Dutch disease. Uh, so we look at new goods margin, we look at the new partners margin as in Hamels and Plino. Both have been important. And even if we look at textiles and uh, clothing, you know, new markets in terms of Japan, Korea, and even uh, so that, that came up, that has been the margin of adjustment for Myanmar. Uh, now, with the development that have happened in Myanmar, we have now reimposition of the sanctions um, at a different level now because uh, I mean different level within the sanction itself, but also the trading structure is uh, much different from Myanmar from 2003, which there were very little fuel exports. Um, and there now is a comparatively high share of fuel export. There are also uh, new markets that have been linked in, which is like I was in, within the existing products, be it agriculture products, also textile, clothing, and all. So, how the new sanctions play out is going to be a very pertinent research question uh, as part of market integration. What role the will ask? Because ASEAN uh, was a big shock absorber in the earlier period of sanctions because it was not extended to. Uh, the sanctions did not extend to ASEAN countries, but I think in the current sanctions that have been reimposed, ASEAN has been also been comparatively proactive uh, in kind of extending sanctions to of different degrees, not to the extent maybe on the Western countries. But so it, it needs to be seen that how will the trade adjustment take place? Uh, and uh, some of the recent discoveries of natural resources with the gas and all which are where uh, Korea, for instance, has Korean companies have really uh, ventured in into Myanmar in, and there's a lot of exports to of natural gas to China. So whenever you are focused on natural resources and we, it will be, now it's a big component of Myanmar's export. So we really, one needs to see that what will be the, this extensive margin imply. 
uh, for market integration of Myanmar and uh, quote unquote what can be the potential big potential big risk actually of uh, of Dutch disease that one could have. So, uh, and these are all the, I'm not going to get into, and there are all these regression results in terms of what we are trying to, uh, we have been talking about and following the Clino and uh, rule methodology, but looking at different time horizons, and different partners margin, because they only look at goods margin and we look at on load dimension. Yeah, so I'll stop there and then, you know, but we're very happy to just have any questions on that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Devesh, for a very um, well interesting uh, presentation and sharing the results of uh, your study. Um, all right, so I, I think we're a small group, so it's uh, it's it's just a simple uh, session that we have for uh, Q and A here for uh, Dr. Devesh to answer our questions and concerns in relation to um, yeah, the, the presentation. So, okay, so just uh, very fresh. <laughs> There's a question here, Dr. Devesh, coming from um, Sunil Saraj. So it says here that, uh, hi Devesh, excellent presentation. Just wanted to clarify a few points for better understanding. So first, in the coefficient slide, what coefficient suggests, uh, and can you please explain again, and mm. what are those one to 14 serial numbers? Yeah, um, so, go ahead. Yeah, so no, let me just, uh, so if you go here, right? So uh, so the point is that you look at the growth in exports say year one to year four, right? So you're looking at the change in uh, exports at the least traded goods, right? And that you are regressing on the overall trade, right? So that overall trade growth, you can look at different time horizons, right? Year one to year four, how much has been the growth? Year one to year five, right? So these are the coefficient that you're looking at for different time horizons, right? And then, uh, so that's what, you know, one of the Kyo and rules uh, central propositions is basically that uh, different time horizons matter for extensive margin. If you have a longer time horizon, then the contribution of the least traded goods, growth in least traded goods trade, is it has a bigger share in the growth of overall trade, right? Over a longer period of time. So those are these different time periods, like if you look at year one to four, year one to five, year one to seven, year one to the different time horizon. Because that's the essential idea. That's one of their big hypotheses in, in the QN rule paper that uh, what happens is that the least traded goods margin actually contributes more over a longer period of time. That is what you would expect, right? That you know the goods which were not traded before will start getting traded and contributing more to trade over a longer period of time. As you know, as things become clear, market scoping takes place and a lot of, uh, you know, you build a brand and you build a connection. So there's a lot of things to take some time, but over a longer period. So even in the case of sanctions on Myanmar, so new margins were coming up, right? But the role of this new margin in contributing to the overall change in Myanmar's trade were more significant over a longer horizon. That's all these results are showing you from that table. Sunil, does that really answer it for you? Yeah, so uh, yeah, you, uh, Sunil, you can just um, uh, send a follow-up message if, uh, yeah, all right, all right. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Devesh. So they mentioned that uh, he appreciates your, uh, your response. So there's another question here, actually. Um, it's, uh, it's another question from Sunil and also from Dr. Tandaki, uh, somehow related, talking about, uh, can you elaborate more on uh, what you mentioned about uh, least traded goods? Specifically, as Sunil asks, uh, what is the share of least traded goods in overall traded goods? And is there, a, is there any benchmark to define that? So we are basically using the benchmark that, this was the, uh, essentially the, 
whole innovation that uh, uh, which actually uh, Kyo and Roel brought in. That's why this paper that they came up with this idea of least traded good. Uh, so they use like uh, like if it something is uh, less than one percent of. So you can begin to see that one of the big innovation that comes from Kyo and Roel that it becomes dynamic, right? So basically that, you know, you, uh, and you can see that something which was, and they give the example of Korea and all, they were like high end manufacturing was less than 1% in 1960s, right? Now it is more than 60% of Korea's exports, right? So, and that's, that's why this famous, uh, this paper became so famous and became so important in understanding the idea of margins in trade. So then they say least traded good, they look at something which is traded less than 1%, right? It's like, uh, but this is going to be dynamic, right? And that's going to be so, uh, so that uh, margin will expand and the, what was going to be least traded goods in say 10 years behind, right? Might not be least traded goods 10 years ahead, right? right. And this is what uh, is the innovation in the QO and rule paper is to look at this. Uh, so most of the paper that talked about the extensive margin before, they did not take into account this dynamic concept. And so it's, you know, it's a paper, it is, you know, it's a wonderful read in, in the sense that it must be the simplest of econometrics and statistics that you can have, just description, just describing the data, but just plotting the data. But it's still, it's like, you know, published in general political economy because it's such a phenomenal paper in trying to understand that how trade actually takes place and how it is related to policy changes. What we try to do it to bring in in relation to some shock, which is like sanction, which has not been done in the literature that, you know, we say that this margin adjustment is also going to happen when you are subject to a shock. There are all reasons to believe that, you know, once you're put to a shock, you like to look for different partners, you like to get into different products, right? That's your coping mechanism. That's why in the title we said, effect of shock as well as coping mechanism. And uh, when you're looking at trade liberalization, you're looking at structural transformation, then it's all trade promoting changes in some way, right? And, uh, but here is that, you know, trade inhibiting changes and then how the margins in of adjustment take place and that's what uh, we try to do. So they start with least, uh, less than up to 1% trade, right? Then they change the different windows, 1%, 5%, then they do it with different values for sensitivity, right? But knowing that all along this would be like dynamic, right? Uh, at different point in time, it would be a different good. They are only focusing on the goods margin. They are not focusing on the partner's margin. But we have tried to get in on the partner's margin, which is the other way of looking at extensive margin, that is Hummels and Clino kind of thing is like new products, but new partners as well. And those are the two margins uh, on which the adjustment take, took place in case of Myanmar. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that, that very clear, uh, clearly answers the, the question about what's that benchmark. And uh, as you mentioned initially, you can look at this as those with uh, trade shares that are less than one percent initially at a given period of time, but this changes over time. So it's the, the least traded good in a period might not be the least traded good in in, in subsequent periods. as trading issues. So thank you, Lebesh. Yeah, you know, that was the that that's the main point that you know something which was like absolutely not traded and all, and over, over a time window you see them it becomes so become the main uh, you know even in kind of fuel, for instance, in Myanmar, that's what exactly happened in petrochemicals, right? They were not traded before now. All this uh, Chinese and Korean companies are <laughs> looking at all the new discoveries of uh, natural gas and petroleum in Myanmar, and there's a big rush there. Um, yeah. So yeah, uh, so thank you, Devesh. Uh, Dr. Tanda Key extends her, uh, is thanks to your uh, answer. But there's a follow-up from Sunil. Uh, in relation to your comments, just a clarification. So how to account for those goods which have been going down? So earlier they were not uh, considered as least traded goods. Uh, I mean, the 
<clears throat> point is that you know uh, how do you account for it meaning that you know they would uh, some of them uh, uh, might be just even dropping out that's not a problem right uh, it is not uh, the, the product is basically this thing is not important that you know which product is coming in or coming out from the perspective of measuring the extensive margin right in terms of your strategy and in terms of your policy right this might be of a concern that which products are now reducing on which margins right but to show from a from an empirical perspective that you know what expansion or what changes are taking place on the extensive margin this is not it is totally neutral to policy we are not saying that you know that comes you know which is the second composition effect right where we bring in that if you uh, it's happening in more in natural resources in petrochemicals that is has been the source of extensive margin adjustment to sanctions in myanmar then you can have a lot of complications or you know it can be important for different reasons that you know this this is the adjustment so you have to do something about you know if you really care for whether you know the petroleum is coming up or uh, you know textile is going down right uh, what are the components of this extensive margin adjustment that would be important from a policy perspective right uh, but the first level what we are trying to show is that whether the adjustment is taking place on the extensive margin or not and there you know what is going up what is going down it becomes neutral from that perspective right it really does not matter is that you know we just wanted to show that there is a lot of extensive margin adjustment uh, on partner as well as the goods margin now what to do with that i mean that we're saying that you know if you do uh, definitely in myanmar case you want to really do go the indonesia malaysia way try to build up your manufacturing right and the services sector so that you don't are not prone to getting something like a dutch disease right that you know uh, because and you know literature tells it with different names it also tells with natural resource curse they also call it dutch disease so natural resource curse does not even go through the exchange rate channel it can tell you what how other sectors are crowded out right and that has really long term deleterious effect on the on this economy right so 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 uh, we'll be very agnostic on that that you know uh, we're just looking at the on one component but we do think that you know this really centering on the natural resources and all that has potential detrimental effects that can happen for Myanmar. So something needs to be done in terms of trying to diversify, learn from countries like Ch Chile, learn from Thailand, learn from uh, Korea, learn from Indonesia, Malaysia. There are a lot of uh, places to learn from on that one. What should do about this type of adjustment? Thank you very much, Dr. Dibesh, for uh, those uh, response and insights that you shared. Um, there's also a request, uh, Dr. Dubesh, for if you can kindly share your PowerPoint presentation to the participants. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, just give me a day because uh, I prepared them in a uh, in lot of haste. So I just will just make them a little more, you know, but easier for you to read right now. It's, yeah. uh, uh, it's not labeled very properly. I'll, I'll just do it. Just give me a day. I can just uh, put in the forum and you can just send your email in the chat or something. And But, but I'm definitely very happy to share. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Devesh. So uh, Dr. Kandiak, you also don't risk requesting, but uh, yeah, for, for the participants who are interested, then, then Dr. Devesh will be sharing. Just give him uh, some time to, to be able to, to finalize <laughs> uh, the slides. All right. yeah, so it's, uh, it looks a little uh, sketchy at places and some of them are uh, you know not very informative in terms of title and all so that will be just easier read i'll just give me a day or two i'll just i'll, I'll, I'll have it ready right. and then thank you anik for uh, for uh, yeah for uh, helping us with the dissemination of the document i think uh, uh, dr uh, tandaki provided uh, uh, email address in the Q and A box. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I think no, we can still, yeah. Like I said, we, I can still, we can still uh, 
accept uh, another question probably from all the participants if there are any. Uh, if you wish to talk, uh, we can actually unmute you <laughs> because we're a small group here. Like we have participants here from uh, Myanmar, like uh, Dr. Kim Mar. If you have some comments or questions as well, uh, you can you can type them in or we can actually unmute you for you to, to directly ask your question if you're interested. We can do that. For other participants, just please type in uh, the box. So while waiting for that, uh, Dr. Devesh, I have one question as well. <laughs> you mentioned in the, the, the discussion that the ASEAN uh, plus six tends to be something like a shock absorber during mm -hmm. the times that, that the sanctions were there. But when you were mm -hmm. mentioning the, uh, the, the, the countries where exports are happening, it's more on the plus six side and not the ASEAN. So I'm interested in the methodology when you did the ana analysis, did you do it per country or ASEAN plus six as a, a group? When you try to look into uh, the, the effects of uh, the sanctions. So we actually did both. First, like, you know, look at, uh, you know, ASEAN as an importer, then ASEAN plus six as an importer, and then also individual countries in each of those groups, right? Uh, that's to see that, you know, where within, like for, uh, within ASEAN that, you know, we know that a lot of, much of it was going to Thailand, for instance, right? Uh, and uh, so, so we have done for both, but that you're right that, you know, uh, and why would we put like ASEAN and ASEAN plus six? Because this is also for a particular reason that, you know, uh, when you go to ASEAN plus six, you're moving towards like RCEP. That's what now RCEP is. So it becomes like a precursor to RCEP, right? Uh, that, you know, now all ASEAN countries, I, I really, I was just was trying to go to the literature that, you know, with all the things that have been, hap which happened politically, uh, you know, what will happen from uh, Myanmar as an ASEAN member country, what will happen in terms of RCEP, right? You know, would, uh, will they have the same arrangement or, so those things I've not been able to find in the literature, but uh, but if you look at from this phase one of sanction that is there, at least uh, when we say ASEAN plus six, I mean, that you're very right. I mean, you know, you have very keen eyes to spot that, right? So, uh, but, but the reason was uh, just to say ASEAN plus six, because that becomes the springboard for what will be like RCEP, right? And this in terms of going forward for the ASEAN countries, uh, you know, India actually opted out from RCEP at the last moment because uh, probably we got very scared about what <laughs> will happen in competition. But yeah, uh, but this is going to be one of the biggest trading arrangements, right? Uh, and uh, so that's why we actually focus on ASEAN plus six, saying that this would be like a, kind of a springboard to uh, uh, RCEP. What yeah. role they're playing and that can do, yeah. uh, but you know, uh, thanks. You just really were very discerning in saying that. Okay, this is no, this is not so much ASEAN. This is ASEAN plus three and six, yeah. But that was the reason of putting in that category as well, just to yeah. see that in the harder. Thank you, Dr. Vesh. I think that 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 also makes sense to, to be able to look into not only the ASEAN but also the bigger picture moving forward on what uh, things would be happening. So it's more of exploratory in a way. And it's good to see that uh, it's the bigger one that really uh, says something about supporting some of these possible shocks that may happen uh, outside the ASEAN or ASEAN. Yeah, and that also tells you the import, that is I mean, import in terms of the potential that you know, RCEP then presents because, you know, these just, you know, Japan, you bring in Japan, Korea and all, right? And then you see how the textile and uh, clothing exports uh, expanded for Myanmar. And they actually made up for what was even from the biggest markets of EU and US, right? So there's a lot of, uh, so this is, that's the reason that we're bringing in that one, right? Thank you, thank you Dr. Dinesh. So uh, it's already uh, well in my in my time it's five thirty in, uh, in 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 uh, but but we already uh, have a very uh, um, exhaustive discussion of uh, this particular topic. Thank you to Dr. Devesh and thank you to all the participants 
who actively share their their ideas as the relevant questions for us to have this very inter interesting discussion. So thank you very much, Dr. Devesh, for, for, for this opportunity to, to listen to your presentation and to interact with you and the participants in this uh, uh, session. Thank you. So thank you, everyone. Uh, Anik, you have uh, anything else to, to close? Oh yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Devish and Sir Paul for the uh, presentation and the dis leading the discussion. And also uh, to all of the participants of this webinar, thank you so much for being here uh, with us today, this uh, afternoon, morning and evening, depending where you are now. It's still very early morning for Dr. Devish in USA. And uh, we will have another forum uh, under the Atmi ASEAN project on 1st and 2nd June. So we will send the, the detailed information about the event and uh, see you soon uh, in June. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Dibesh. Thank you. Bye-bye.